guess I'm aware that there is a very high chance I'll be spoiling season one of Solar Opposites in this video. Do I care? <laughs> no. Readers, I'm not even going to tease you. I didn't care for Solar Opposites. But I'm glad that I decided to watch all eight episodes of the first season because I learned a few important things. One, Dan Harmon isn't the reason why I have the problems that I have with Rick and Morty. Justin Roiland is. And two, it is impossible possible for me to be able to turn off my brain and just enjoy a show like Solar Opposites for what it is. That's why during the weekend of its release, despite going into it with an open mind and trying to stay as unbiased as possible considering that this is a brand new IP, I realized that Solar Opposites just isn't for me. Yes, I watched all eight episodes. Yes, I knew not to and actively did not compare them to the seasons of Rick and Morty that I watched. Yes, I was made aware of the point of the show within the first episode. I did and mentally prepared myself for all of these things, but throughout the majority of the antics the four ended up going into, I was still like, I hate this. And while I do admit part of it has to do with my inability to just be able to turn off my brain to enjoy a bit of content that's clearly meant to be enjoyed a specific type of way, there's just a lot about the show that constantly irks me and the fact that other shows and media have proven to be 10 times better in the same field as it. Corvo is just another personification of Justin Roiland's sense of nihilism that's a bit lighter than Rick Sanchez, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Terry is just... an idiot. And a selfish idiot at that, which makes him even more dangerous as the series has shown so far. And then the relationship between Yumulak and Jesse is just... Whoo, child. Yumulak is a sociopathic incel that regularly takes his frustration out on his sister Jesse and has no redeeming qualities about himself. And Jesse, despite her attempts to get him to be more empathetic in the first two or so episodes, just deals with it in the hopes that he'll be better later on, like the dynamic that Sadie and Lars had in the first early episodes of Steven Universe. These siblings are absolutely toxic, and it's extremely hard for me to root for any of them when they, when better ones exist. Like, why in the world would I want to watch these two interact when Dipper and Mabel from Gravity Falls exist? And are better! Oh! You want me to stick to strictly adult animation? Okay. The Belcher siblings. The Belcher siblings. Honestly, the only member from the main cast of characters that doesn't constantly make me want to mouth WTF every 10 seconds is the pupa. The things it gets up to for the sake of gaining access to anything damn near gets a good hearty chuckle out of me every time. It's like Perry the Platypus from Phineas and Ferb, but more chaotic if that makes any sense. Minus all the gratuitous and useless violence that's now common with Roland stuff, it's very hard for me to be able to enjoy a show that personality-wise has characters in it that were on the level of Seinfeld level of shitty. But that's not to say that Solar Opposites doesn't have a hidden gem within its eight episode first season because it totally does. And that comes in the form of the subplot for the season, introduced by the actions of, wouldn't you guess it, Yum Yulak and Jesse with their shrink ray escapades in the first two episodes. For everyone who's seen the first season, I'm of course talking about The Wall. 
You see, after the shrink ray is introduced in the first episode, we find out that Yumulak periodically shrinks adults he doesn't like and places them in a giant terrarium that takes up almost the entirety of he and Jesse's bedroom wall. And to help them live better inside of it, Jesse periodically puts things like candy in there to help them survive. But it isn't until Yumulak shrinks down a guy named Tim, played by Andrew Daly, that we actually get a look inside this dystopian society that these people built for themselves. What we think is gonna be a sea monkey gag that's been used time and time again in better shows like this, ends up turning into a full-fledged story about what will eventually be Tim leading a revolution of citizens from the lower levels of the terrarium, overthrowing the corrupted Duke, played by Alfred motherfucking Molina. Like every time an episode decided to shift its focus on what was going on in the wall, I was all in. <laughs> because for me, everything that was happening in the terrarium was 10 times more interesting than the premise of the actual show. <laughs> they even dedicated an entire episode of the season to the final assault on the Duke, written by Dominique Dirks, that held my attention throughout and put me on an emotional roller coaster. No, no, seriously, I got emotional over the death of a mouse that I was only introduced to at the beginning of said episode. <laughs> then once that episode was over and the next one started, I legit went, oh, right. The show's about them. Is Solar Opposites Trash TV? Yes. It is designed to be able to allow you to just turn off your brain and enjoy the hijinks of terrible people without having to feel guilty about yourself. However, not all of us are built that way. It's very hard for me to be able to flick the off switch like that when it comes to content like this, for example. Like, I'm the person in the Pickle Rick meme that's having Pickle Rick explained to me all while looking at said explainer, like Tommy Lee Jones from No Country for Old Men. That's why the wall subplot of season one, if you could even call it that, is such a breath of fresh air to me. It was my reward for dealing with 60% of the first season. The world building was decent. I cared about the characters. The show's sense of comedy was woven into it in a way that was tolerable. Out of the eight episodes that consisted of the first season, the entire two to three episodes that consisted of the wall subplot is a reward for people like me who just can't gel with Justin Roiland's concepts and sense of humor. With that being said, is the two to three episodes that consist of the wall arc worth sitting through the antics of Corvo, Terry, Yumulak, and Jesse, if you are like or similar to me in this regard? <laughs> Absolutely not. There are plenty of mediums that tell the story that the wall arc tells. Better, even, if you want to feel 100% rewarded as opposed to the 40% that consists of the setup and payoff Solar Opposites distributes. But if you're currently with someone, or if you visit that certain group of friends when this entire pandemic is over, that just wants to sit you down and show you this show, and you have no other choice but to watch it, just know that while you will indeed be Elastigirl in that one Incredibles meme with Edna Mode watching this show, you'll be able to enjoy at least one thing from Solar Opposites. Two of the other thing is the pupa. But, <laughs> I digress readers, your homework assignment for the day. If you've seen season one of Solar Opposites, write in the comment section below what you thought of the wall subplot. Or if you feel like sharing with the rest of the class, write in the comment section if you have the ability to turn your brain off in order to just enjoy trash. <laughs> And if you can, then please, by all means, 
teach me. If you want to help financially support the channel, you can join my Patreon by clicking the card at the end of the video or in the link in the description down below, where you can also find a link to my merchandise store. Or if you prefer to give a one-time donation, you can find links to my PayPal and my coffee account in the description box as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications because I post new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday. But until then, this is Redis 101. Class dismissed. <laughs>